Are you satisfied with your understanding of sustainability? If you are not, imagine a journey together, a pluralistic one, with academia, innovators, startups, NGOs, all looking for solutions to the greatest challenge of our time. My name is Samuele Tini, and this is the Sustainability Journey. So welcome to another episode of our Sustainability Journey. Today we have two guests. Two guests that are bringing here the perspective of NGOs and indigenous communities. We have listened, I mean, our experience in COP was about that now, the importance of having the indigenous community, not only being art, but also being there and then being leaders of the work that is ahead of us. So how we can ensure their voice to be heard, how we can help them, and which is the role of the NGOs. So today we have two experts. We have Darian that is listening from Ecuador, who is bringing here the perspective of indigenous community, and Tara Deporte, who is there to give us the work of the of our organization, which is at the forefront of uh, giving indigenous community a voice. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having us. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Samuel. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> It's really nice to have uh, two guests and have, you know, putting together three different continents in, in a recording. Before we dig in into the discussion for the podcast, you know, which is your sustainability journey? Which is your journey that has taken you through the interest, you know, for sustainability and climate change? We can start with Darian and then maybe Tara. Thank you, Samuel. Well, you know, my name is... Darian Castro, I am from Ecuador, and you know, part of my activities that I have uh, are related with the sustainability and even inclusion of, of some minority groups like indigenous communities, with the, the coordination of some organizations of students in universities or even in high schools. Uh, we have a movement of youth in Ecuador. And we collaborate in different perspectives and in different ways with climate education, scientific education too, with the community, and even with the scientific research too that are linked with indigenous communities and the ancestral knowledge. So basically, you know, we support in the academic uh, perspective the reality of these indigenous communities, even in a sociologic level too. Right now, we have a, a research in that area, in the sociology, and even in the mental health. And our goal is, you know, to show to the rest of uh, society in Ecuador and even in Latin America what happened with the communities during the COVID-19 pandemic and even before the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, the, the lack of uh, support from the governments or, or even from the society in general. So yeah, basically that's my my point. Thank you, Dad, and thank you so much. It's really an important perspective. Tara, now to you. Yeah, so my journey on sustainability, goodness, how long do we have? I'm one of those people that really at a very young age started in really caring about environmental issues as, as young as when I was in primary school writing to my uh, Congress people in the US about saving the planet, which was you know handwritten letters and all of that. And fast forward a lot, I, 11 years ago, I founded the Human Impacts Institute after having worked very much at the grassroots level, particularly in New York City, also with the city of New York around environmental education, um, but also having worked um, with major groups at the United Nations on actually getting uh, women's and youth voices into environmental policy and really seeing that there is a real disconnect in how we're engaging uh, people in the action we need to take around issues like climate change. I can go deeper into sustainability, but I just want to also make one comment on the introduction. I think something that I'll really be able to add to this conversation is COP26 was actually 
our organization's first time in collaborating with indigenous communities. So I think we can really show a lot of lessons learned and a lot of reasons why it was also our first time with this collaboration. And I would also just say, I think it's very important to us that we're never giving a voice to communities because they have a voice and have a very strong voice, but we're using our privilege to amplify and make sure these voices are being heard. So those would just be two things that are also a big part of, of my personal sustainability journey. Thank you, Tara. Thank you for the points. We have already said, you know, which is the problem, which are the states? And, you know, for the second question, maybe we, we can swap the order. So at least we have, uh, we can go maybe from the general uh, with Tara, and then we go to the community level and with Darian to discuss which is the problem and which are the problems they're affecting, you know, especially in the perspective of Ecuador and indigenous community in Ecuador. Tara, which is the general problem that we are facing? We did a project called Climate Crossroads um, with the 10-year facility and the Ford Foundation for COP26. And um, it was uh, 10 stories of climate leadership from women and youth in indigenous communities in the global south. So from all different countries across the global south. And I can say some of what I heard from these amazing leaders was a lot of issues of access, particularly around language. Um, and of course, COVID has also exacerbated any inequities that we see, which are massive, both in terms of the impacts of climate, but also the acknowledgement of who are the experts in our communities. Indigenous communities have been um, living within uh, some of the most biodiverse regions of our world uh, for thousands of years and certainly have a much deeper knowledge of both the systems and best practices there. So that's something that we heard repeatedly. And certainly financial barriers are always at the forefront as well. Uh, no matter what, as a woman from New York City, I have access and privilege that is very different from uh, someone, a youth coming from an indigenous community in Borneo, for instance. And so I think that those um, the access, both in terms of economics, in terms of who we acknowledge as experts, and also in terms of just how we can travel based upon both things such as COVID restrictions, but also finances are huge barriers that we heard repeated across the globe. Very interesting point. Of course, this is the uh, diagnosis, then we will try to find the, the solution in the next question. Now I want to go to Darian. You know, now we are going at the grassroots level. Which are the problems that you and the, your communities there are you facing, especially in the perspective of Ecuador? Well, you know, it, it exists a, a variables that we need to understand. You know, to get a a, a clear perspective of about the indigenous communities, especially in, in the South America level. And uh, one of these is, for example, the differences between the context in the geographical location. There exists a, a diversity of ethnic groups around the, in Ecuador, for example, in the coast region, in the Andean region, and in the Amazon region. So the people that are part of these indigenous communities, like a minority groups in the society, uh, they have different problems in that area. For example, the lack of education access, the lack of basic services. The reason because right now, many communities from Amazon, from Andean and Coast side are working together is because the disrespectful of the territories borders of these communities why due to the because they exist these uh, mining projects oil companies that right now put in danger that borders of the territories in in these indigenous communities and in the same time put in danger biodiversity and the natural resources that these indigenous communities have to survive it's not only a, a you know, a, like a magic idea that many people put it like, a, you know, it's a, a magic thoughts about the beauty of the nature. No, it's resources that the, the indigenous people need to survive. They have medicine in that ecosystems. They have a, the opportunity to have a welfare, a well-being in that territories with their kids, with their families. And right now, we understand 
the two ways that the mining projects, for example, develop in my country. One of these is the legal way. And what happened with that kind of projects, uh, we can see that it's, it's a problem with another problem like a terrorism groups that invade territories. And in the same time, another groups uh, related with the drug dealing or something like that, you know, to wash that money and take that kind of mineral richness and all the territories that are around that uh, mining territories uh, are devastated. And we have many examples about that. It exists a community of Buenos Aires in my territory that was devastated, completely devastated with this kind of mining. Thank you so much, Darian. I mean, that you say the inclusion and solution for the community and also respect for their rights and territories, which, uh, you know, I, I think that is where now the illegal money is. Ecuador is very famous. I mean, to maybe not famous, there is notorious in uh, for some of the worst cases, you know, of, um, of pollution and attacks to communities. The picture you are presenting, you know, from the global level to the community level is difficult. It's really challenging. But as usual, we have diagnosed a bit of the problem. So now, which are the solutions that uh, you are uh, trying to bring? And, you know, I want to start again from the global perspective with the Tara, and then we'll go now to the community level perspective with Darian to see how we can solve the problem you have just outlined. So, Tara. Well, that's always the, I think, is a question we need to explore even at the beginning of every conversation as well. And I think a lot of what Darian brought up is really that we need to see the connections between the different systems and that it's, you can't just take logging you know, as an isolated issue or land rights as an isolated issue or even access to language and education that really more and more, and I think we're having a, a bit of a renaissance in understanding that the climate is a social justice issue. And that in order to address the solutions, we need to really look at it that way. It's not the system that's just over there. It's connected to our economy, it's connected to education, it's connected to women's rights. And that might make it sound bigger, and that's one perspective, but the other perspective means that there are entry points for everyone. No matter which sector you're in or no matter what subject matter you're dealing with, it connects back to climate and it connects back to social justice. And so I think that's one huge thing is that really understanding the entry points are not just scientific or policy or activism, but we really have all of those. And I think the second, and I think this speaks a lot to the amazing organizing work that Darian does, is that there's a lot of listening that needs to happen first. And I think that the idea of listening and building trust within communities, that's the same issue in New York City as it is in you know, communities, indigenous communities across the global south, is that there are ideas, there are expertise, and we need to listen and understand that it's not always our role to partner or to collaborate. And I think that's something from the international perspective, why this was the first program we've really done in collaboration with indigenous communities is we don't have indigenous leadership within our organization. We don't have expertise in these communities, um, but we were approached with an opportunity to partner with a group that does and to use our network, to use our access to elevate these stories and to work with them. So I think understanding that not all of us, not all of our groups need to be in every community and that that involves first listening and also having an invitation from those communities. I think that's a huge part of really having long-term solutions to these issues. And I might say it's a game changer in a way we approach because usually it's the all the way around. So it's really a numbering view that you are giving us and I've really two interesting action point. The holistic view, and I like really like the, the social justice, you know, climate change. I mean, it's the donut economy and other approach they has given us very clearly. You know, there is no silver bullet and only one aspect. We have to look at the holistic part and especially the listening. 
what is happening in the community and everywhere, you know, because it's not just a problem, you know, but planetary problem. But now let us listen, you know, now since you are discussing of listening, let us listen to Darian. You know, Darian, you have given us a perspective and really you have showed that the problem that uh, you and your community in Ecuador you are facing, uh, faced by the problem of the mining and the illegal activities, the encroaching on border, the social issues, which can be the solution, which are also your uh, revendication and the solution that you are trying to bring with your, your work? Well, like Tara mentioned, for example, uh, the access in the education and all about that tools that are so important. I think it's necessary to have that support, but especially with a specific tool that they can use to develop in a new productive matrix in the perspective of nature-based solutions, for example. One of these alternatives that right now we are exploring with some friends from my university, for example, it's promote a new approach of the pharmacology, for example, with this ancestral knowledge and in the same time, give the opportunity to indigenous people to get um, you know, a scholarship, even with our institution, and understand more about that knowledge that in a scientific level, it's a treasure, a great knowledge that we can get. And in the same time, to show in the scientific community, because that's the problem. And even in the, in the scientific community, it exists an inclusion, it exists a, a, you know, a a lack of inclusion in these kind of groups. When they have, you know, many academics don't understand what happened during the COVID-19 with these communities when these communities didn't have healthcare access in their territories. And they still be fine. They didn't have a, a peak of the COVID-19 cases. And that's so strange and it's very useful for the scientific community to understand that. But unfortunately, the support in that area, it's so cheap. We don't have great support in that area. So basically, I think that's the main goal that we need to do. Give the enough tools in the technical solutions or something like that. In the communities today, don't depend on the, you know, the charity of these groups in the oil companies or even in the mining companies too. I might like to add, because I think I've, I've done so much personal learning um, uh, in the past year around working and collaborating with Indigenous leaders, you know, something that really kind of changed things in my head a little is, is really understanding how much of our current academic and scientific systems are very much continuing colonial ideas of, again, expertise and knowledge. And just an example that you know, in, in one of the fields that I've worked in in environmental sciences, if you've done a field work in a region for 20 years, that would be an incredibly long time to have done your research if you're coming from a university, for instance, in the US or Europe. And imagine the expertise of 20 years compared to the expertise of generations and generations in the same location. And somehow we think that the 20 years is worth more than the generations. And I think for me, that idea of we're still just placing this idea of value, of misplacing the idea of value of knowledge of systems, of places, of people in this system that is continuing ideas of we know better. And that really changed a lot in my head to really even see an, a, a perspective in that way. Thank you, Tara, for that. It's really a perspective, you know, that sometimes, you know, you put somebody, not even 20 years, that is a considerable amount of experience. You know, you get people from one month, two months, and, you know, and especially from my experience, you know, I've been in Africa for 16 years, and before you understand the social issues, the discussion, and also to go deeper, you know, it, it really takes a lot of time, and then a lot of humbleness, you know, to be there and to listen. You know, sometimes you need to, to listen to people. And in a way, people that like us and others, they can be a good bridges within communities, which is, and can be relays and, and help, as you say, elevate the people. And I want to ask Darian another question, you know, because the mining and these uh, parts of problems, it really, it's really affected me the way you have discussed. So, you know, Darian, how can we, of course, you and, you and the youth there at the grassroots level, I mean, of course, you cannot provide a solution right now, but 
what you can do to stop these kind of activities, or at least to make sure that you know their impact is um, it reaches the policy makers, and so so therefore they can act. I think in, in that problem, for example, in the political uh, representation of these communities in my country especially it's so complicated and complex why because right now for example in the congress of my country the indigenous party of my country are leading the congress right now you know they are a majority that is insane because in another uh, political periods in another presidential periods uh, they didn't have that kind of power right now But unfortunately, um, exists a lack of leadership in these organizations in a political term or even in a social term, because we need to understand that in, especially in the, in the Latin America, the indigenous communities have a social a organization and a political organization and they work together. Well, that, that would be the, the goal or the ideal model you know, work together, these kind of organizations to, you know, have a representation in an international level or even in a political level in the Congress. And unfortunately, we can see that don't exist a leadership in these organizations. Some of these, for example, indigenous leaders have a great initiatives, but unfortunately, they don't have enough attention from the political leaders or political representatives And they just ignore it. And right now, I think the reason because that happened is because they have right now uh, more interests around the political circle. I think that's a, a problem in my country, especially that's the problem in, in the policy making solutions. Because right now we have some problems with the election of some uh, laws to protect ecosystems, fragile ecosystems like Galapagos Islands, for example. And we had a negative response in the first time for the, the president of the Congress that she is an indigenous. It's very complex to understand that kind of policy making spaces, especially in the local level, because they have an, another interest despite of their condition like a minority, or they have a pressure, a social pressure around the political circle in the Congress. The solution, I think, it would be Uh, elect a new generation of the politicians, especially with the young people. Uh, right now in Colombia, they will have a round table of the young people in the Congress. I think that would be a great solution because when the young people or even indigenous communities that suffer the needings in their communities, they know what happened and they know some solutions that they can use. But if it exists another community that is a representative, I don't understand that problems. It's so hard and so complicated to get a solution in that area. That would be the, the solution I think we can have in a political level. You know, it's a problem that even in COP26, many people it's fighting against that the political issues just is the important thing and the rest of meetings don't care. Thank you, Darren, because you have put the point, you know, also you are giving a, us a point to be the voices, the, the people that can be there as watchdog, and also to put them on action. Because sometimes, as you just said, you know, maybe the political, especially you know, the face out, face down, you know, uh, last minute uh, discussion uh, really um, showed the, po the power of politics rather than, you know, the power of the science bed and as well, you know, what is now common sense. I mean, I, I'm not criticizing, but I'm just saying what is I'm thinking. And I'm sure also Tara can, <laughs> can have a lot of words about that. We have a very good discussion. You know, we started with the global level. We have gone down to the specific level. And then we see now we are starting to touch on how, you know, especially from our different perspective, we can be enablers of change. And again, I want to start, you know, from uh, Tara to discuss a bit your perspective with your um, not-for-profit organization, how you can be an enabler of change and ensure that we solve the issues. Sure. Well, we see ourselves very much as connectors. Um, we're not creating anything new. We are connecting really creative minds that know how to inspire us, that know how to engage us, that know how to touch us you know, deeply. 
uh, and we're connecting them with the experts in what we need to get done. And I think that's the space where we're experimenting is that we truly need the climate movement to become more of a cultural movement and not just an informational movement. And we need to speak to people, to their community, to their sense of identity, because that's not only how we influence hearts and minds and how we truly build a movement that's effective, but it's also you know, how we can start dreaming within the process, how we can really start in helping people envision what's possible. Because unfortunately, um, we're animals that get very stuck in what we know, even if it's not good for us. And we see that with the world. I mean, I think we could all pick out many, many examples of that. But once you, you know, see something that opens your eyes up to the possibilities of what we could create, that suddenly starts getting people to want to take part. And I think that's really missing from a lot of our climate movement. We see it happening in, in particularly with a lot of younger people that are really using art as a tool to engage and to build community. But that's what we do. And I think we need so much more of that um, because we're not doing enough. We're not listening enough and we're not sharing stories well enough of where we want to go. Personally, I'm a little bit over, particularly as an American, I'm over the conversation of talking about what so much of the problems. We know how many problems we have, and particularly as the ones that have predominantly caused it from the global north, we know who's responsible. So like, let's get moving each other, you know, and, and getting everyone to take a step further. Yes, definitely. I mean, now the problems that are clear. Now it's time for action. Darian, for you, we have listened to your passionate call, you know, during the COP and then the intervention at the plenary. As a way, you know, for discussing and trying to wrap up, you know, of course, then we'll ask her also her message, but we can ask you also, what is your message that you want to give, especially to the people and the audience of the podcast as a, as a call for action from your side? Yeah, well, I think... The reason because many people in around the COP26 we have uh, that representation in the plenaries or something like that was because especially the political uh, circle start to understand that uh, we need to, to know more about the, what happened in, the, in other territories to take actions. And uh, unfortunately, in many cases, for example, in the position of and other indigenous communities, they didn't have that opportunity, you know, to say that. But because of Tara and, and her organization, I had that opportunity. And I appreciate that so much uh, to Tara because uh, without her, uh, I didn't have that opportunity. So the message for the community and for the young people too is to start from the bottom with some initiative that they have you know it, it, even if they think it's a little idea or an impossible idea they need to try to uh, make that possible with you know talk with uh, some collaboration and international collaboration right now we have the opportunity to connect with everybody and get in touch with everybody in different countries in different territories and I think that's the key, you know, understand the benefits of the technology right now, the communication technologies, and show more about the, what's your message and, and your initiative that you want to show to the world. Thank you, Darian. Wonderful message. And I think, you know, also this podcast is from the very little things that I'm trying to do myself. And as you said, the role of technology. We have three continents now connected and recording. So this one would be, I mean, somebody on, in the Rift Valley in, in Kenya, somebody in Ecuador, and, some, and, 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 Tara in, and Tara in the north. So, you know, it's really amazing. And then you can see, make your voice out. And Tara, I mean, you have been instrumental. You have given voice to community. I want to know, which is the message you want to give to to the audience from your perspective? It's always hard because there's so many important messages. And I have to say just, you know, Darian is an amazing example of just a, a wonderful leader and organizer. And it's been an honor to collaborate with him. You know, I would mirror a lot of what Darian said. You know, there are, I think people need to give who they are and understand their impact and influence. 
So no matter what your interests and what your role, whether you're working in a business, whether you're you know, doing grassroots work, whether you're in policy, you know, it connects with climate and you can make a difference with that expertise and with those interests. And I think understanding your impact and your influence means, you know, I'm not going to have the most influence in Darien's community. They don't know me, we don't speak the same language, we don't have the same understandings. And it's also not my role to come to his community and, you know, organize and say what, what should be done. However, you know, I have community in New York, I have community in Holland where my dad is, I have community here in France, and understanding what those connections are socially and how we can use them to really build momentum. Because it's my friends, it's my colleagues that trust me. They trust me as a source of information on climate and on what to do. So my biggest impact is going to be with those connections. And I think we all have those. And that's as much as just within our families. You know, Our families both listen to us and don't listen to us more than anyone else probably. <laughs> So, you know, I think that's really, really key, you know, and just as a, a last example, we had a delegation of eight, mostly young people from around the world that went to COP26. They all had a completely different experience and they explored different avenues. Some were in the streets, some were in, in the political negotiations, some were in the cultural, you know, theater and exploration, and they all took part. And I think that's huge, even at something that is high level policy, it's not all about high level policy. And so there are so many successes within that experience that aren't just the, the official outcomes of COP26. And I think that's always important to remember. We have to give ourselves wins because we know the losses, it's easy to see those. <laughs> but we have to see those wins and we have to celebrate them together as well because that's what keeps us going. Yes, and only gather momentum from there. Thank you so much, Tara, for your point and also for your work and the work as also Darian is doing with the community. I'm sure we'll go back to Darian also to go deeper, you know, on the ground with him on some following episodes. And maybe we'll give voice to people even in their language so they will be able to sort of fluently discuss their issues. I really want to thank you so much, Darian, and for his work and the discussion and Tara for also for the great work that she's doing as an enabler and a connect in the global north for, for us people that stay in the south. Thank you so much and it's been a pleasure and an honor to having you. Thank you. It's been wonderful to be with you both. Thank you so much, Samuel, and a privilege to be in this. Thank you, Darren, and then thank you, Tara. Thank you so much. Are you satisfied after this wonderful episode? Let's continue together our sustainability journey.